it's my pleasure to introduce Carlin Diamond, Life Path Consultant, teacher, and pioneer woman of personal growth in our community. <laughs> Absolutely. She is here tonight with her Perks of Aging group members. This is a support group that's been meeting for seven years to discuss the challenges and the perks of aging. So thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. I have organized myself, partly because I'll be turning 80 this year. And, <laughs> and I really appreciate those senior moments, but I don't want to expose you to them. <laughs> so I'm very excited about, oh, happy May Day. Yeah, May 1st. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm happy you're here and happy you're supporting a healthy aging process in yourselves and the lives of your friends and family. I have had a wonderful time preparing my comments uh, for this talk. We are, mostly my generation, pioneers in living longer with a much higher quality of life in our later years than our parents. There's much to say and to cover in this short hour, hopefully, we will open some doors for future thoughts and actions. Aging is something we start in babyhood and continue until our last breath. How we do it is more in our control than we may think. Aging is not for sissies, said Irma Baumbeck, Baumbeck many years ago. Many thanks to Avenues to Wellness Group for setting up this talk and time together. Uh, especially the most efficient and helpful team of Suzanne Pichetti and uh, Ananda Johnson. Special appreciation to the Willett Center for the Arts for making this beautiful space available for this time and other community events. As I said, I'll turn 80 in July of this year. I have six children, ages 6 to, to 58, 17 grandchildren, I have six children, ages 43. Okay. <laughs> I, need, I need to follow my own <laughs> notes. <laughs> now I need to look at them. <laughs> and 17 grandchildren, ages 2 to 27. The 27-year-old granddaughter is uh, getting married, our first grandchild to get married uh, this year. Um, I've worked as a teacher in some capacity for over 60 years, believing that educare, the root of education, means to bring out from our students the beauty and creativity they have to offer to the world. I've been interested in exploring and learning about all the developmental stages in this interesting species we call humans. In preparing for this talk, I was pretty amazed as I reviewed 40 years of volunteer experience with elders groups of one kind or another. I just sort of did it, and I was just amazed when I accumulated all of it. As a teenager, I remember watching older people on the bus, studying their wrinkles, and deciding if they had smile wrinkles or frown wrinkles, and which I would choose for myself. And I guessed I had better smile a whole lot more. I also noticed that the older, wrinkled faces transformed when they smiled. I was fortunate enough to spend treasured time with my grandmothers and my great-grandmother. Being the first grandchild, I got many transformative smiles from them. Somehow I knew that they had experienced uh, pretty hard lives and that their pain as well as their wrinkles seemed to melt away when they smiled at me, their first grandchild. In my 40s, it dawned on me that I had probably lived about half of my life, was middle-aged, and that there was a time limit to my existence on this earth. It was a shock when it really sank in. I'm seeing that with my children now. <laughs> oh, my children are middle-aged. I didn't seem to have really good models for growing older. It seems that in my family, people get more depressed, in pain, discouraged, and sick 
as they move into their 60s. I was without models of healthy aging, and I reached out to get some help. I knew I wanted to see some examples of good active aging, like humor, resilience, happiness, wisdom. My way of reaching out for help is to ask the universe for guidance in what I need to learn or experience for my next lessons in life. My help came about in some unusual and consciousness-raising ways. It was the 80s. I was volunteering for Jerry Jampolsky's Center for Attitudinal Healing in Tiburon, which set up support groups for children who've had a diagnosis of life-threatening illnesses, mostly cancer, plus groups for their siblings and parents. Attitudinal healing is about adopting a more positive attitude about circumstances we find ourselves in. The groups help the families find a more positive outlook on end-of-life issues and provided playful experiences for the ill children at this severely stressful time in their lives. My life changed one day. An 83-year-old woman named Mary Small came into the center and requested a support group to help her senior living center. She adamantly stated that she needed a group to heal the aging seniors' attitudes. She said they just complained all the time. Their only conversation was about their surgeries and their doctor's visits, grumbling about their children and their grandchildren, etc. She said they needed an attitudinal healing, and would we help? I loved her attitude and found myself stepping up to her challenge. And my enlightenment about the elder population began. I was teaching yoga in a chair for other senior center, another senior center at the time, and was enjoying that. So I accepted the thought we could learn as we went along using the center's principles. I love a creative challenge. There were no other groups like this one at the time that I could find. Mary gathered about 25 people, and we started. I was with this group for eight years. I would bring in subjects and themes, and we would start talking. When the conversation started veering toward the negative, I'd steer it to a more uplifting way of seeing things. I was touched by how much feeling would come forth when they reflected on Mother's or Father's Day memories, and how alive and present the tears were with memories about their own parents. I'd see the little girl and little boy in them shine with a story about their parents and siblings. Their stories about their childhoods were engaging and full of feeling. I wondered how we might sustain a more positive approach at this time in life. I was also interested as to why they were dwelling on the negative so much. In an evolutionary sense, the more wary, skeptical, and suspicious our ancestors were, the more likely they were to survive. The survivors were not the ones who let the saber-toothed tiger get too close. Made sense. The Center for Attitudinal Healing says that fear and love cannot occupy the same place at the same time. We no longer have the threat of a saber-toothed tiger, but we do have many other things that feel threatening and out of control at this stage of life. So our default is to slip into fear and it trig triggers feelings we all have and we've experienced maybe at a younger age and a more capable time of life when we had more resilience and bounce back from emotional or mental pain. In my 50s and 60s, I was caregiver relief for hospice for about 19 years and dealt mainly with elders in their dying process and with the family and friends of the dying as they adjusted to their loved ones' changes at this time of life and at the end of their life. By working with all of these magnificent elders in their end of life and dying process, I personally benefited by getting a little more comfortable with this last cycle of life. I felt I was more knowledgeable and emotionally available to my parents when their time came. The cycle of being older and more vulnerable Losing control of our lives as we know it, needing to slow down, needing to ask for help, 
finding patience with another rhythm to our lives, feeling frail, lonely, like the world is moving at a faster pace than was comfortable, dealing with health challenges and pain. I began to see the end of life needs in our communities in a similar way to the beginning of life needs we tackled in the 60s, birthing and prenatal and so on. I began to feel that this time, just before we exit this earth plane, has the same sacred feeling as the one when we entered. I wondered if there will become a time when we can be as joyful and uplifted by honoring a life well lived and ending as we are now when a life cycle begins. The circle moves and it's completed. There are, I, I started seeing life um, in cycles and bear with me, but one, one cycle, the early cycle, of the, maybe the first 30 years is like a circle. We're young, absorptive, we're taking in, we're applying, we're figuring out things, but just mostly being very absorptive. The second cycle, roughly around 30 to 60, is like a spiral out. We're reaching out to build to explore, we're creating, creating our families, creating our lives, our work, and so on. 60 to 90, the spiral starts to come in. We're evaluating our compost. Compost is made of all our garbage, right? <laughs> yeah. We're refining, we're reflecting, re-choosing, realigning our lives. Then, 90 to 100, back to a circle. Only this time, we, have, we reflect and we're looking at what we're going to share, what we're going to leave behind, what's our legacy. So, 90 to 120, perspective. Still got some work to go. Learning how to live in the present moment, it gets much easier, <laughs> being in the present moment. All these things that we worked so hard at in our 40s and 50s become much easier. Unconditional acceptance and letting go. Letting out go without feeling that we're losing something. It's just a joyful time to release and let go. So I think in terms of physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, they all kind of weave together as the same thing in a way, but... In our culture, we tend to emphasize one more than another sometimes. There's a handout about that for you when you leave. Um, the handout is about what are you nurturing in your life this year physically? What are you nurturing this year in your life emotionally? What are you nurturing in your life mentally this year? And what are you nurturing in your life spiritually? this year. So it gives you a little nudge to kind of think about, oh, okay, whatever stage you're in. We are just adjusting to and entering the cycle of retirement at a time when most of us are called upon to care for older members in our families, like our parents who may need our help. And our kids are having kids <laughs> and they may need some help. We become the sandwich generation, squeezed between. Those romantic trips to faraway places <laughs> evaporate or are scheduled into our already busy calendars as desperately needed mental health breaks. It's a tough time, you know, it's a tough, tough time. All of this was one thing in the abstract, abstract and then seven years ago when I was around 72, uh, I was feeling myself fully in the seniors camp and wanted to feel more comfortable with getting older. I found myself putting a question to my friends and the universe pleading, there must be some perks to this aging process. <laughs> please, please tell me what they are. My friends would laugh, but they didn't really offer any real encouragement. <laughs> Just a shrug 
and then they tell me a few senior citizen jokes. And it's good to laugh. So another creative challenge arose. Seven years ago, I started a group called the Perks of Aging. It was called the Perks of Aging Salon, because salon means it's, it's a discussion group, you know, around a subject kind of thing. So we endeavored to find the perks if they existed. At the very least, we would have some laughs in the pursuit and keep our minds off our ailments for a few hours a month. I, this time I'd like to introduce you to some people who have been in the Perks of Aging group. Uh, we have a, a core group and then there's, oh, a couple of dozen people that have come through the group and moved on to other things. So if Perks of Aging people wouldn't mind just standing up for a moment that are here, or if you had any connection with Perks of Aging. And they'll be available for some, for some questions in a moment, so you can sit back and relax. Some have been with the group for all seven years. Um, two of the original group have moved to Washington State. They left us with a memento and tribute to their humor and wisdom and Vanna White, alias Erlene, will model this for you. <laughs> That's called the hand book. <laughs> Creation of Martha Carroll and Anna Wilson. Uh, and there's an old bag in which to carry the hand book. The old bag on the outside looks pretty gray and worn. But look at her inside, or his inside. <laughs> yeah. They still keep on our mailing list because they just want to hear what we're up to. One thing I will not be giving you today is all of the information and lists of what you need to live through a healthy and happy eldering process. We have an internet for that. <laughs> and there are many people to help you with that, if you need. Um, oh, here's, here's something that, an amazing guide, and I, I don't think I've asked one person whether they have this guide or not. Mendocino County, this is the 2008-2009 one, Senior and Disabled Resource Guide, courtesy of Community Care Senior Information and Assistance Program, the Area Agency on Aging in like in Mendocino counties. It's just chock full of information about all kinds of groups, you know. So whatever you want to, you know, uh, I can leave it out for you to take a look at. But it, this, anyway, it's countywide information. There's, there's so much help and so much goodwill out there. And that's one way to get in touch. Um, what I will give you are some of the ways to not just survive, but to thrive as an elder. Evolution and culture are not always kind to a generation of people who are no longer useful as workers or biological procreators. You lose some cred. Solid research is coming out from Stanford in a study titled, Pessimism About Old Age and Dementia suggesting that negative attitudes toward aging are a risk factor for dementia. The difference was hardly trivial. Study participants who have positive beliefs about aging were 44% less likely to develop dementia over the next four years than were their counterparts with negative beliefs. 44%, you yeah. know? We in the aging population need to step up to two heroic and creative things. One, appreciate our gifts, talents, and resources, and use them in ways which bring us aliveness and uplift our spirits, inspire ourselves each day with books, sayings, classes, groups, laughter, reminders, etc., so that we keep our positive intentions intact. Two, be your own primary clearinghouse to find the right people to aid us when we feel that something is not right, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Trust your intuition. It is, it is magnificent. 
you know. You know when something's off. We're not a preventive medical culture, exactly, you know. You go and have a little hunch of something, and the doctor says, well, wait till it flares up, and, you know, I'll meet you at the emergency room. You know, and not all, not all. I'm not picking on all of them. But, you know, as a general rule, it's not preventive. Willits is one of the kindest, most helpful, and accessible communities I know of for help as we age. And in spite of that, we don't have a gerontologist here. <laughs> you know. We are in a hotbed of healing helpers, plus having our magnificent hospital and physical therapy department available to us all. A diagnosis is not a stopping point, just because you, you can put a label on it. It is just the beginning of exploring the healing and curing options available to you. When you don't get satisfaction, get that t second or third opinion and check out another option. I know several people right now who are researching and reaching out to lesser known methods of healing for life-threatening health situations. You know the old adage, I don't want to have a doctor who thinks I'm going to die in three months. And wait, when we are ready to die, we also have a caring and kind community support system for help with that stage of our lives. Uh, Suzanne's going to help me now. And just to get focused on what the challenges you know, and the perks might be for aging. Uh, if you'd suggest, we'll take about five suggestions. So anybody who wants to just shout it out, I won't try to get a mic to you for this. But the negatives, okay, there's the perks. So what are the stereotypes of aging, the negative things that you feel like you might be a little bombarded with uh, in our media or just society about aging? Okay, so let's start with challenges. What, give, give me some pictures of what some of the challenges are. Memory loss. Okay, memory. Next. Loss of mobility. Mobility. Third one? Pain. 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 Okay, perks. What are, what are some of the good things about yeah. aging? Time. Yeah. More time. Time. Yeah. Wisdom. 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 Less responsibility. Less responsibility. Afternoon naps. Anything else? Senior discounts. Senior discounts. <laughs> Sleeping in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's a, a possibility of, of being a mentor. Mentorship. Oh, oh mentorship. Did you have Medicare? <laughs> well, that's going to be nice. No, Medicare? No, no, no. no, 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 no. Okay, so there are some. And there, believe me, lots and lots and lots and lots more. I just wanted to kind of prime the pump a little bit. Uh, to be thinking about the ch some of the challenges, some of the perks. And because this, we wanted to emphasize the perks. Uh, we know these, <laughs> you know, we know them well. Mary Small, that woman that I mentioned to you, was 83 years old. When she came to the Center for Attitudinal Healing, this is how she came. A wonderful sparkly smile and all, but here's how she, you know, why? Because she was afraid of losing her balance, and so she was, you know, and it was painful for me in my 40s to walk with her at that pace, but I forced myself to because I wanted to feel her rhythm in life. Our minds need a rest more than sleep. Yes, we need sleep, but 
distraction gets a little bit more acute as you get a little bit older for most people. So to rest your mind, let's try a little something right now. So if you'd kind of put your feet on the floor. Would you dong that I can't, I don't have a hand free. You have to hold it by that, yeah. Okay, just take in a nice deep breath and let it all out. And when you breathe in, get your body involved. So let your belly be relaxed and open. And as you exhale, pull your belly in tight. Squeeze it all out. And one more good big breath that way. Open, expand, and then exhale. Let it go. Relax your breathing. And look down at your lap or close your eyes. Imagine yourself on a bridge. There's water beneath the bridge. And let any thought that's in your mind go right now. Worries, concerns, things you should be doing, things you shouldn't be doing. Just any thoughts, anything that's pressing on you right now. Just free yourself for the present moment. You're standing on the bridge, there's water below, and you're letting go of stuff. Feel your shoulders releasing and relaxing, your neck. Feel the weight on the chair. Just feel the present moment, just that's all that is. Something else coming into your mind, it goes off the bridge. Then you get your power back. You're not a slave to this busy mind. Let it go. And again, let it go. And let that go. <laughs> OK. Now take a nice deep breath and bring yourself back to this place. That was just a few seconds. Gently open your eyes. That's available to you anytime, any place, any grocery line, <laughs> any place. Just a moment, a moment to get into that present moment. So a quieting of your mind, a quieting of your emotions. Movement. Alzheimer's disease begins to develop in the brain 20 to 30 years before a diagnosis. Two-thirds of those diagnosed are women. And women are two-thirds of the caregivers. Maria Shriver, founder of Women's Alzheimer's Movement, says that we have all become so obsessed with our bodies that we've forgotten to take care of our brains. Quote from her, I was speaking to the head of neurology at Stanford who said, my waiting room is filled with 70-year-olds, with bodies of 40-year-olds, and no minds. And no minds, wow. There are choices to be made about what you can do to improve mental health. She says that is that she could tell people, if she could tell people any one thing to prevent or push off dementia, it would be exercise. And we're learning that fat's good for the brain. Brain's got a lot of fat in it. But exercise. And that doesn't mean you have to go out and run a marathon. <laughs> it just means like if you're sitting there right now and you start to feel a little drowsy, just squeeze a few muscles. <laughs> It'll wake you up, lift your legs up a little bit, wiggle. Clench your fists. You know what wringing your hands is? Wring your hands for me. And that's sort of, sort of um, like, oh, that's a bad thing to do. You know, like someone who's kind of nervous or irritable or something wrings their hands or annoyed. But they're finding out, I love these brain scans. They're finding out that you have activated your brain cells, your synapses, plus given uh, ease for some arthritis pain. Motion is lotion. Keep moving. Wiggle your toes. Wiggle your fingers. Shrug your shoulders. Turn your head. 
do kegels. You know what kegels are? <laughs> squeeze your buttocks. Squeeze your, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do that very quietly. Nobody knows you're doing it. <laughs> It'll wake you up. And you're exercising. Yeah. You're moving, getting circulation. Not just blood to circulate, but lymph. Yeah, you, need to, you need to move. Get things moving. Now, if you would extend this one bit further and reach for someone's, I see you're already doing it, you too. <laughs> Hold hands with someone next to you. You can double up if you only have, don't have, yeah, have <laughs> left over. Okay. You have just soothed each other's emotions with a bath of comfort. Because we're pack animals. We need to touch, we need to communicate. Say hello to one of the people next to you. Tell, tell them your, f no, don't add to it. <laughs> tell them your first name. Now tell them your age. Okay, a little hard to tell someone your age for some people. Yeah, not so much here. Yeah, great. You stimulate all kinds of brain cells by just wringing your own hands or by touching someone else, doing a little hand massage. I saw this with the elders that I worked with down in Marin. It was amazing. They'd come in all kind of grumpy and hunched over and stuff, and we'd hold hands and massage hands. And color would come into their face, you know, and light in their eyes. And I thought, ooh, something really great's going on here, <laughs> you know. Let's, let's hold hands more often. Something they don't tell you about when you want to live over 100 years. It's already been brought up here. Uh, that you'll most likely live those extra years in a good amount of pain. We need to decide how we're going to cope with that pain. There are choices. And one of them is exercise. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Nothing holds still. Everything is changing all the time. You are on a moving planet hurtling through space every moment. Habits are really stuck places. Some good, not so good. Some of our habits really served us earlier in our lives and Maybe they're not appropriate now that you're 50 or 60 or 70, you know? So look at those over. Cha you can change. <laughs> Death and time. This is definitely not a polite thing to do, so please forgive me, because it's a real great awakener. How many of us in this room are going to die? <laughs> a perk of aging is recognizing that time is precious. And when am I going to do something I need and want to do? If not now, when? When I'm in my 90s? <laughs> Maybe look up a distant relative, hug a friend, travel somewhere. You know? but it's nice. It kind of gives you a little, okay, there's an ending. Okay, a nudge. Oh, I'm kind of achy. My knee's hurting me, but I'm going to go on that cruise anyway, whatever it is. The divine discontent, that restless, dissatisfied part of you, that becomes grumpy and ed edgy. None of you have that problem, but I do. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, it's your creative energies trying to get your attention to write some stories, paint that picture, take those photographs, etc. You are here to do what only you can do. If you don't do it, if you don't do it, it won't get done. And you've just got a few years maybe to do it. We are remarkably complex and unique individuals with gifts, talents, and resources to share. We never know when what we say or do will be taken in by another as just the right soul food for the next step on her or his journey. So those are some thoughts. Now, I'd love to hear from you with questions or comments about aging, perks of aging, what, whatever 
challenges of aging, questions you have, and uh, the Perks of Aging group that's here um, has volunteered with a little arm twisting to uh, be available for <laughs> any answers or comments uh, also. So any questions here now? And Suzanne, would you like to? Yeah, I, I have a question, and, and it's something that um, I hope everybody can understand. Um, I live my life as who I am and love to be out there in the world, but I have a question. When we hold each other's hand, the closest one to us, and you said to share our age, what does that have to do with sharing your age? Well, some people have trouble sharing their age, uh, and it's like it's just a number, right? I mean, you, if we went around and said, "Tell me your age," you'd go, "Oh, you look so young," and "Oh, you look so old." <laughs> In our minds, you know, I find that happens at my high school and college reunions, you know, and I'll go back and I'll think, mm, "Are some of these people my former teachers or what?" You know. Because we, you know, we do it in our own way, and it's nothing bad or good or what. It's just we're different, you know. So the, just just to put it out there and just say this: this is my age. This is how it looks on me. <laughs> you may be the same age. That's how it looks on you, you know. Yeah, it's just one of the little kind of taboos in our society not to talk and talk about our age and a cutesy thing in my generation and older. Oh, I can't tell you my age. Don't ask me my age, you know. It's like, oh, come on. That's that's all I did that for. Thank you for asking. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, question? I just was stimulated when you were talking and putting the challenges and perks, and, and uh, I got a little shy to just call out. But for me, I think one of the greatest gifts of close to 78 is acceptance. And um, because if I can't love and accept and love on myself, I know that I don't have all that much time to love other people. And uh, that's w what is so important to me now. And to accept my changes, it really has made it so much easier to love. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I think you know I'm interested in is, is some of the differences that there may be between men and women as we age. And it always strikes me as when I go to gatherings like this, how many very vital, alive women are in the audience and how fewer, you know, vital, alive men are here. Now, we're not quite at the age where just men are dying off and so the audience just doesn't have as many men because we die sooner. Um, but I know, you know, when Carla and I got together, one of the first questions she asked me was whether I was in a men's group. Because that was, seemed important to her as we were getting to know each other. And I've been in a men's group now for 40 years, same group, and Carla and I have been together for 39 years. So I'm just interested in, you know, Carlin's perspective and anybody else's about what are you noticing in the perks of aging or your experience about why men are not as engaged in, you know, in exploring or in dealing with these issues and maybe related to why, in fact, men die sooner generally than women do. Uh, one of the reasons I married a man who's five and a half years younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, I recognized last weekend, I was with a friend, and we were talking about being cougars. And I, had, I hadn't thought about being a cougar. And her, her partner is a couple years younger than him. Her, and I thought, oh, I'm a cougar. How exciting. <laughs> I just hope he'd last, you know. <laughs> he's, he's a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, in the Perks of Aging Group, in the last seven years, we've had over 30 people uh, that have kind of checked it out. And, you know, a few meetings or, or like some have been there all seven years. And uh, only three men, <laughs> so uh, except for one stalwart, Rick's been there all along. <laughs> so we're not all wired the same, um, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. They the women uh, want to sit and talk and process, and we're different, men and women. <laughs> you know, we really are, and there's all shades. Of 50 shades of gray, you know, we're <laughs> all shades in between. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely a difference in, in the way people. And Jed's been in his men's group for 40 years, uh, one of them. And uh, those guys are faithful to each other and stick to each other and have meetings and work it out even though they've moved. And so, you know, all kinds of guys. Some like to sit around and process and others don't. So, so my question is for all of us here. Um, as you have stepped through the various ages, um, which are all chronological, of course, and they come with graying hair or uh, some wrinkles, have you begun to uh, feel the aspect of invisibility? There's, uh, I, I, and I think it is in our community, but I'll tell you, if you go out and travel or you're in a line for an airplane or you're in a line for a... a a cup of coffee, uh, somehow your space is just taken up by other people. And I, I, think it ha I think for myself, I have gotten very angry about that. And I've gotten very angry about ageism. So one of the things that I proposed for myself is that I stopped telling ageism jokes. I stopped telling stories on my deficits you know, to make other people laugh at me. I stopped telling other people about my aches and pains. It's all in that part that when I believe we begin to respect ourselves and our wisdom and our mentorship and our abilities, then those are the stories that we begin to tell. And it's up to us to begin to change the concept of what getting older means. And I don't, I like to say getting elder you know, instead of older. So I ask a question and I answered it myself. So yeah. <laughs> Two for one. This morning I was talking to my cousin who's the same age as me and she's married to a man who's 15 years younger. So he's 54, she's 69. And he keeps telling her there's something wrong with her because she wants to take a nap every afternoon and she can't do the distance that they used to do, hiking or biking or whatever. And he keeps saying, there's something wrong with you. You need to go to the doctors. Or so. And I was laughing. I said, I'm so glad I'm married to Don, who's the same age, <laughs> so that we could be on the same page. So the whole idea of being a cougar or getting a younger guy just sounds horrible. <laughs> It's like, why do you need this? You know, he doesn't understand. And, and I remember being 54. I, th I thought old people just got lazy. I thought, well, why are they going? You know, all they need to do is exercise. Well, the reality of being older is accepting maybe you do need a nap. And that's okay. So what? You need a nap. And then you get up and you do whatever you're going to do. But I thought that was really funny. I, I don't understand the younger man thing at all. <laughs> It seems like one of the big challenges for aging is the that we need more support as we get older and sometimes there isn't always as much support maybe as we would like. What have you guys found about that or discovered about the isolation factor and needing more support as you get older? As a gay man with a and my husband and I've been together for nearly 40 years now. Um, We've lived through the AIDS crisis and, and lost 
uh, an entire generation of our friends and somehow came out of it okay, I guess because of our relationship and, uh, and never got that horrible disease. But um, uh, we wa we're, we're now we're going through a second, a second time of losing friends, this time from the aging process. And uh, I look at community now and the community of Willits, where, where we've lived for 31 years now, as a family, because we don't have children. And, uh, but we feel a part of this community and we feel supported. And I look around this room and I see uh, many, many faces of friends that I know and love and care about and that I feel care about me and I think that community and the community that we have here is something really special you folks I want to tell you from having traveled around a lot that there's something about the community of Willits and I and very possibly in other communities as well but there's something special here and I feel like it's a family and I feel a, that it, that you are my family, and I love it here, and I feel blessed to be here. We love you, Bill. <laughs> it's, it's really nice to um, have an elders kind of support group atmosphere uh, because you can talk about things that your kids don't want to hear, you know? Because uh, just think about it. we talk about getting more frail or older or pull the old one. You better come and visit because <laughs> I'm about to, you know, I'm almost 90 kind of thing. Uh, won't be around much longer. <laughs> but it's, it's really important to have a place where you can talk comfortably, you know, with other people. So your, your circles with elders are very, very precious, you know to be able to share things that we just wouldn't. My parents certainly didn't. Thoughts? Is your group open now to oh, the Perks of Aging. Um, I can help you if anyone is interested in Perks of Aging uh, or wants to have help in getting their own group started. I'd be personally very happy to help you do that and perhaps some people from Perks of Aging. Uh, so just call me. I'm in the phone book. <laughs> Jed or Carl and Diamond. Uh, just give us a call. And my uh, email is on some of the handouts that go out to you. So just call, and I'll, I'll help you, whatever your needs are. Uh, I'll help you with that and get connected. And our group, yes, is it, it's open. It's not a closed group. But there are some, some things, because we talk very confidentially about a lot of things and very deeply. And we have a lot of laughs, <laughs> and tears, yep. And just a real deep emotional honesty that I've just treasured with all of you for all these years. Yeah. So I just wanted to share a little bit about some of the things we do, and that is um, almost monthly we have one of us present something, some, something of interest to the rest of the group. Uh, we've had different people present uh, acupuncture or ways, herbs that might be a benefit to various people in the group. Uh, we've had people talk about caring for our elders uh, and how that, how to do that, because so many of us have done that and are going through that process even as we speak. Um, let's see, other things, uh, writing. Erlene gave a writing workshop. Kind of, yeah, memoirs, yeah. And, um, oh, we talked about wills. We talked about, you know, um, in a, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> we talked about health directives. We talked about putting down our wishes for end of life care by our family. We talked about making little memoirs for about each one of our children and grandchildren just to be able to pass something on to them. Uh, we looked at opportunities for um, wh what, what was a green way of, of uh, being buried, whether it was uh, by in a, into a tree or into the ground, or where are those options? And I believe we gave two workshops on uh, green burials. Um, 
uh, we've talked about acupressure facelifts and um, massaging your feet and massaging your hands and um, just uh, it's painting. We've uh, we've tried art art classes. We've shared those things that we have time to do now, and um, and some of us have taken them on uh, very seriously. Uh, we've. I we were come up with a, a Carlin is very good at coming up with uh, thoughts that open us up to expressing more be very provocative questions <laughs> we've talked about um, the whole idea of me too and what do women um, what attitude in women helps men think that they can do the things they do where do we need to change as we try to change them? Uh, so it's been a, a wide variety, and some of them are listed over there on that um, forum over there. Thank you for the question. I just was wanting to um, mention that one of the important things for me and talking to people in my age group or older was a small book that I read, which was Who Gets My Pets? Because that was very important to me that because at a certain age you're thinking I don't know and you do see life as precious and you know waking up the next morning it's like yeah I get a whole other day to you know to live and give and love and have compassion but there was this very um, important part to know that there was someone there that I know was going to get my pets and, and that was a very comforting thing for me to um, discuss. Something that occurs to me sitting here and looking at this group is that it's Anglo-Saxon, Protestant probably, majority. I don't see a black face or a brown face except for myself in this group. And the question that I have is people live and grow up and they have a history of a different culture than what we see and what I'm hearing because most of what I'm hearing here is absolutely foreign to my ears and I'm having difficulty understanding anything anybody is even talking about because of the cultural differences that do exist but do not exist in this room. So what's your cultural you say, talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't understand. Louis, can you say more where what is hard for you to understand and what you are called, how you are called to You have 24 hours to sit and listen to me? I can't sum it up in one minute or two minutes. But there are cultural differences, and it appears no one in this room is sensitive to that fact, that there are other cultures and ways other people think, act, behave, and especially among males. Well, I think you're making assumptions about people in this room. I'm Latina. I grew up in another culture. and. I don't have a problem with anything anybody's talking about. So I don't know why you're kind of projecting an anger. I'm not projecting anything other than telling you my perspective. But so I don't know why. Women think it's oh, different. we know that. We know that. <laughs> Where That comes with age. <laughs> but why don't you share what your perspective is? You don't have to take 24 hours because I have a different perspective about growing old, but this is me now in this culture versus who I was as a child in another culture. And I'm sure there's other people here you may not recognize as coming from another culture. So don't make assumptions. That's all I'm saying. Thank you for sharing that. That's the kind of thing, Lou, that is really precious to be able to share in a group, you know, when we can talk deeply about what our cultural differences are, you know, and practices and so on. 
And that, that happens. That happens in our group. Yeah. Thank you. I was just, as I was talking to my cousin this morning, we're saying, you know, we're talking about how much we exercise and how much weight we're going to keep down. We're going, how come grandma never had to worry about exercising? <laughs> grandma always looked like grandma. You know, she was always round with a little corsage. And nobody told her at 60, 70, 80 that she had to go to the gym or lose weight. You know, she just made her beans and gave us some tortillas and grandma was cool. And she lived to be 92 and ate lard every day of her life. So, yeah. She had 18 kids. She worked. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And, and, you know, like what is it about our culture that we have such a youth-oriented you know, the whole Hollywood bullshit, that we all have to stay slim, we all have to stay attractive to whatever this crazy thing is. But I just thought that was funny this morning because I, I love my grandma, I thought she was beautiful and she always looked like grandma. Well, we could probably go on another half hour, but I think it's time, I'm getting the signals here. Uh, it's time for us to uh, wrap up. Thank you for your lively conversation for your interest, for your enthusiasm, for being alive, <laughs> getting here, <laughs> being here one more day in this present moment. And uh, let's uh, do one more handhold. Let's make a circle. Stand up and make a circle. We all come from one, and unto one we shall return like a mountain stream. Flowing back to the ocean like a rainbow of light, returning to our side. We all come from one, and unto one we shall return like a mountain stream. Flowing back to the ocean like a rainbow of light, returning to our side. We all come from one. And unto one we shall return like a mountain stream, flowing back to the ocean like a rainbow of light, returning to our side. One more. We all come from one, and unto one we shall return like a mountain stream, flowing back to the ocean like a rainbow of light, Returning to our side. <laughs>